Right. And so very much welcome to James Borg from the University of Kiel, who's going to be talking to us about coloured noise. Over to you, James. So hello, everybody. I'm just going to make sure I can share my screen. Um, I also apologise for whatever the closed captions end up saying. Some of the um, closed captioning of my lectures have been less than accurate. Um, it's the background Brummie accent, I think. So let's see if that will work. I'm hoping you can all see that now. Yes, that's fine. Excellent. Okay, so, so I'm going to be talking about some work that, um, as, uh, as Susan mentioned, won the best paper award last year at um, the Artificial Life Conference, came as a, quite a shock because um, it was technically in, in Montreal, but none of us were there. Um, I had gone to bed by the time the award ceremony was happening and I had no idea that the paper was even up for it. So I got a lot of text messages at about midnight telling me that I'd, uh, where, where was I? <laughs> I was in bed. So um, years and years I've watched others win it and I was asleep through mine. So um, the title of the talk is Coloured Noise and the Evolution of Environmental Tolerance in Artificial Evolutionary Systems. And this is some work I've done with collaborators, including Fiona. Um, I'll mention all of those collaborators at the very end. So the basic motivation for this work is, is evolution. Um, I think that's the basic motivation for the work that most people do in artificial life, um, which is the field I probably most align with. I go to the conference as often as I can. So um, taking directly from um, an update of the paper that won the, the award, um, evolution responds to environmental variability over multiple timescales by mitigating the risk associated with both short-term and long-term environmental change, maximizing immediate fitness, whilst also ensuring continued survival. So what I and my collaborators are interested in really was, what well, the two things really. First of all, what kind of environments exist in the real world? What, what kind of, what would the natural environmental time series look like? Because clearly, you know, we have all evolved and everything that we've seen on earth has evolved under those kind of conditions. And we see all sorts of astonishing adaptations, um, the kind of things we'd love to see in artificial evolutionary systems. So maybe taking more inspiration from those, from these really ecological time series might be useful. Um, but also just generally an interest in, can we, can we understand this balance between specialism and generalism? When do you specialize, when do you generalize? And when do you, when do, you do both? Um, species like humans, and uh, the person I primarily work with on this is um, a guy called Mac Grove, who's an evolutionary anthropologist, um, so he's very interested in humans. Um, humans are a really great example of highly adaptable, highly uh, generalist species that can also specialise extraordinarily well. So can we take something from human evolution um, and motivate us to produce better artificial evolutionary systems? So here we explore how different colors of noise affect the trade-off between evolved specialism and evolved generalism in fluctuating environments. So first of all, colored noise. So I'm not a physicist or a signal processing person. So my understanding of colored noise is basic at best. Um, so I understand them best diagrammatically. So if you produce any time series, you can decompose that time series into its constituent um, constituent sine waves, I believe, if someone can correct me. So you can, you can break down any time series and look at the, the spectral density versus frequency, um, which I'll show you some images of in a, in a minute, and basically say, well, this is the same kind of relationship you would get if you were to break down white noise or red noise or something in between. So you can categorize uh, a time series or noise as a color associated with, associated with light. So white noise, sometimes also called Gaussian random noise, it depends on how you produce the white noise, is essentially noise with uh, no correlation between time step to time step. Every single time point is, is independent of what's come previously. So you get things that look like this over here. Um, Noisy, bouncy, the, the mean remains the same, it's stationary. You also commonly hear of red noise, sometimes called brown noise or brownian noise. 
Um, now, red noise has a lot of water correlation. So we have each time step is heavily influenced by the time steps that have come before. Black noise being an extreme case of this. So we don't talk about black noise here. I just put this up for illustration. And in between white and red noise, you get pink noise. Now, pink noise is very much a middle ground between um, white noise and red noise in the sense that you get quite large perturbations, but you still get um, each time step has, to have some dependency on previous time steps. So when looking at colored noise, um, we came across the work of Halley um, in the, the late 90s. Um, Halley seems to be the guy who's done most on, um, on colored noise um, and ecological time series. Um, he does a lot of population dynamics work, for instance. And his work, if you want to go to get a kind of basic understanding of this, his work is probably the best work for this. Um, so what you can do is you can take any time series and you can plot the spectral density of all of the constituent um, frequency waves within it to show how influential any given frequency wave has been on that time series. So very basic understanding here. So this here is, I believe, um, red noise, which shows that kind of lower frequency sine waves are have a higher spectral density than higher frequency sine waves, which makes sense because we have kind of general trends appearing in our red noise time series. So it suggests that lower frequency, lower frequency waves, lower frequency influences are influencing the time series much more heavily. So if we were to look at lots of different waves on this kind of basis, what we would see is that white noise is interesting and often used by people producing time series, the noisy time series, because waves of all frequencies are um, equally represented in white noise, which leads to there being no particular influence at all. Every single time step is independent. Whereas um, Halley calls it brown noise, but red noise here has what we call a one over F squared relationship, which is why colored noise is often called one over F noise. And pink noise is interesting in that it's one over F. So the relative frequency per relative inference per unit frequency is one over the frequency of the wave. So Halley says this is particularly interesting in the case of pink noise, because actually, if you really think um, the way we think about colored noise, instead of thinking about how much influence per unit frequency there is, um, and think about how much influence per unit time scale there is, that is to scale, they say at any given point on a time series, how much influence has each of the constituent waves had on that time point. Pink noise actually has equal influence across all, whereas white noise is more biased towards are, um, are kind of higher frequency waves and, and red noise, brown noise is, is more focused towards our lower frequency waves. So Halley argues that actually we should consider pink noise as the null case for environmental variability. Um, and he, based, he backs this up with some evidence from, from, the, from the real world and real ecological time series, which I'll move on to in a, in a minute. And the reason he does this is because in the literature up to that point and still, white noise was heavily used in population dynamics models and artificial life models as a way of producing kind of evolutionary time series, um, or environmental time series, sorry. And Halley is like, well, that hasn't got any real basis in, um, in ecology. And also it doesn't really get out what we want from a noise time series. So as he points out, Ecologists expect both rare and common events to be important. So you don't think that what happened yesterday is, is more important in terms of weather than um, what's going on in terms of the sun's sun cycle. It is important if it rained yesterday, it's likely to rain today too, but the chances of it raining at all are heavily influenced by the, by, by, by the regular sun cycles. I can't remember what they call for the life of me. Um, long-term trends matter, you know, long-term heating matters in climate change, for instance, you can't just ignore what's happened before. 
um, and just take you know each individual event as uh, an, as a unique event that's happened without influence. And Halley argues that pink noise balances these rare and common events perfectly um, to enable a quite interesting uh, interesting time series that promotes certain features that we see in evolution. And that's the angle that, 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 we, that we took too, though we decided to look across white noise to red noise to see how different types of coloured noise affect evolutionary dynamics, especially evolving specialism and generalism. So these plots are produced by my, my, my colleague, Matt. Um, so this is just white noise, um, pink noise and red noise, just another example. And looking at the, the, spectra, the spectral power against frequency, you do see this kind of relationship. This, this, there isn't any particular relationship there. There we have kind of a um, heavy focus on, on high frequency noise. And we see how the relationship gets more and more. Well, the exponent increases, this beta increases. So you have a, a beta and exponent of approximately one with pink noise, approximately zero with white noise, and approximately two with red noise. So, it's approximately because it's very hard to produce perfect, perfect time series that conform um, directly to the type of color that you'd like. So I mentioned the ecological time series. So Halley in Halley's papers, he produces a lot of references to evidence of ecological time series from um, terrestrial temperatures, rainfall, um, river heights, um, all showing kind of pink noise to red noise levels of color. And um, Matt thought it'd be interesting to take out a really well-known ecological time series. Um, this is the benthic oxygen 18 isotope. Don't ask me exactly what that means. It's related to temperature. Uh, Matt tells me it's very interesting and important. Um, the record from the North Greenland Ice Core Project. Um, this is uh, available data um, over the last 120,000 years. And Matt decided to look at the, the log power over the, the log frequency. And it produced a, an exponent a beta of 1.4, which is right on the line between what you consider to be pink noise and red noise. And it's because you do have these longer term trends, kind of, kind of trends down and trends up, and these sudden perturbations that you see in pink noise. But the trend is quite clear, so that it has a very red shifted aspect to it. So, for me, as an artificial life researcher who's trying to understand the evolutionary systems and is trying to evolve adaptive behaviours in evolutionary systems, um, my specialist area is cultural evolution and social learning. I want to get out of my systems what we've got out of nature, you know, highly adaptive, highly versatile um, agents. So it occurred to me and that, well, why don't we use coloured noise, especially pink noise time series? Why don't we do it? Or do we, and we've just not read the literature properly, we've read the literature and we don't, we don't do it. Um, I think I found a paper from an old ALA conference, which I've never found again, um, where someone did it once. Um, but essentially we use white noise, sometimes we use red noise, um, but we very rarely look across the whole coloured noise series and we never use pink noise. And there's very few, very few simulations that use pink noise for anything within evolutionary systems population dynamics. And this occurred to us to be very odd. And we thought, well, let's produce a simple evolutionary model. In fact, let's use the evolutionary model that Matt's already produced for previous work, he published in Adaptive Behaviour, and adapt it to look at evolutionary dynamics over a range of coloured noise from, from white to red. So we did. Also, Matt's really heavily, heavily interested. I should mention he's very heavily interested in human evolution, he's an evolutionary anthropologist. And he points out that. If you go to sites of, um, you know, of, of ancient humans, um, I can never pronounce this, I think it's in Kenya, um, you see within the geology, um, within seeing um, lakes that appear and disappear over evolutionary time and sediments and, and dust and indications of temperature, you see these long-term trends where humans were evolving kind of 150,000 to 50,000 years ago. Um, these fluctuations and they are you know these oscillations do look like they're they're, they're pink on many scales or, or it, when we're talking about many different um many different features so you know it's worth investigating so matt produced this 
it, this very simple, I think beautifully simple model. Um, he produced it a number of years ago from that behavior paper um, and then adapted it here for our purposes. And this is, the, this is the work that went into the Artificial Life Journal article. So we had a thousand agents, very small population really, I suppose, but I suppose large for most A-life models. And the agents are simply um, two features, two loci genotype. The mean and the standard deviation of a, a Gaussian function, that's all. So each individual is basically expressing a Gaussian. The task is that given, uh, given a, an environment that you're trying to match, um, how much fitness you get out given your Gaussian. So if you've got a very small standard deviation, and your mean is perfectly on the environmental value at that time, you get very high fitness. If your mean is perfect, but you have quite a large standard deviation, so you've squashed your Gaussian function, you get a lower fitness, but the advantage is that you're a little bit more general than the agents that have got very narrow, uh, narrow distributions. So you get less fitness for getting it exactly right, but you get a, a better distribution of fitness over a wider range of environments. So you could put that generalism versus specialism. So you can try and evolve to track the environment by moving, by moving the mean around, or you can just become as versatile as you can by, by making yourself, giving yourself what, what my Mac calls a niche breadth, you know, having tolerance by having a larger standard deviation. Um, I think this is a really neat kind of really simple way of producing individual dragons to test this. Um, we had some kind of arbitrary, um, arbitrary parameter settings like we often do in A-life models. Um, so we decided to remove 50% um, of the population at every single time step, the, the worst 50%, 50% with the, uh, the lowest fitness at the time step. Um, we had asexual reproduction, but the sexual reproduction didn't, didn't do anything at all to the results. And when we did preliminary tests, so we thought unnecessary complication. Um, so we only have mutation. Um, we use fitness proportion selection in order to um, in order to replace the 50% that we've been removed. Mutation is relatively, relatively simple, just a Gaussian random number added to the mean, and we use a Gaussian random number again um, for the standard deviation. But of course, we, we don't we can't we don't want negatives here, so we do something slightly different, but essentially with the same the same kind of outcomes. Um, and we've been for quite a long time, 65,536 time steps. There are um, signal processing reasons for that, I'm told by, by Matt. Um, I, I, just, I believed him. It turns out this is much longer than you need, as you'll see in our second set of experiments. Um, I think we only took the results from the last 65,000 time steps because after a couple of hundred time steps, everything was stabilized, as you'll see. So our first set of results um, came out showing. I suppose what you might expect actually, but it was really nice to see it. So the green lines here, I'm sorry, it's green and red. Um, I didn't produce these graphs and this one is colorblind, but I have a lot of trouble with it. Um, so the green line is the environment. This is how the environment changes over time. Um, this is a pre-produced colored noise time series. It's really handy to produce your colored noise time series before you run the simulation. If you try and do it on the fly, time step by time step, you end up deviating quite heavily from the uh, color you are hoping to achieve. It's uh, much easier to produce it beforehand. And there's details in the conference paper and hopefully in the journal article should it be accepted. We've just recently submitted a journal article extending this work. So the red line shows the population mean. So the mean fitness, um, so the mean fitness, no, it's not the mean fitness, it's the mean, mean value. It's the mean locus one, um, you know, the mean, of the means of the population. And what we see is that white noise, there's some attempt to track the environment, but essentially you're just kind of wobbling around the, the, the environmental mean, which makes a lot of sense with how rapidly white noise changes. And the fact that there's, there's no long-term trends to hang your hooks into and go, okay, well, it's an upward trend, so we can, evolution takes those who are going that direction with it. Whereas here there's, there's none of that. There are sometimes pretend phantom directions that evolution tries to get hold of, but essentially you end up coming back down again. Um, with red noise, it, it tracks very well. It tracks very well because it's much more predictable. Um, 
And when it's not predictable, the perturbations aren't huge. Um, they're big enough to cause disruption, which provides a, a pressure for, for agents to react quite quickly, but they can react quite quickly. You know, the population just react quite quickly. Pink noise is in between the two, really. Um, the direction is tracked, but the larger perturbations are difficult to follow. Um, so the population means sort of almost, almost follows, but doesn't quite follow the environment. So what does that mean in terms of tolerance? So if we just look at the top, top plot here, so the exponent here refers to the color of the noise. So two is, is red noise, one is pink noise, zero is white noise. And actually people consider anything below 0.5 to be white, 0.5 to 1.5 to be pink, and 1.5 to 2.5 to be, to be red. Um, anything above 2.5 is, is black. So if we look at the tolerance, that's the second locus, our standard deviations. Um, what we see is under white noise, the standard, devi the standard deviation that's evolved, the tolerance that's evolved is quite large. We have quite a large tolerance and quite a range of tolerance as well. Whereas a red noise, there's very little tolerance because at red noise, you can track, you can track the environment and at white noise, um, you essentially can't. So it makes sense to sacrifice the level of fitness you're going to get in order to cover yourself for the possible range of environments you're likely to be likely to encounter. Whereas you don't need to do that so much in, in red noise circumstance. Um, we see this also with, with the actual fitness that's produced. We get quite high fitnesses um, at red noise because it's trackable where you get much lower fitnesses at white noise as a result of evolving tolerance as opposed to specialism. You also get a larger range of and values exhibited within the population too. So one thing that I immediately noticed with these results and I found really interesting is the sigmoidal shape of this top graph here. Um, you see it in both actually, but I think with tolerance it is more interesting. And it seems to pivot around pink noise. It seems to be that a pink noise there's a transition from specialized, not very general, not very tolerant individuals to non-specialized, highly general individuals. And at pink noise, you seem to have sort of general, but sort of specialized individuals. And I thought that's, that's really quite interesting. So what we did is we, we, we fitted our, our raw data um, to a, we fit our raw data to a curve using a robust LOES method. I can't remember what L-O-E-S-S -S stands for. Um, I did look it up earlier again and forgot immediately. But what you see, if you take the first derivative of that tolerance graph we just saw, we see that you know, the rate of change is highest at perfect pink noise. Um, and this, given what Halley, Halley talks about in terms of having this equal, influ equal influence uh, per unit time step in regard to pink noise, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think we're seeing this precisely because you have a perfect mix of long-term influence and short-term influences in the time series. You're having to do both under pink noise. You are having to try and follow the general trajectory of the environment, and it is sort of followable, but you're also having to react to some quite large sudden changes based upon sudden perturbations based upon you know, very, very, very high frequency, uh, high frequency waves, high frequency influences. So I don't think that's a coincidence that we see that. And we see kind of a relative amount of stability um, once you drop off past the ranges of pink noise. Um, I don't think that's a coincidence. And I think, but I don't know, I think this requires a bit more thought. We're saying something quite important about the nature of the environment evolution takes place in in order to promote adaptability and specialism, which I think anyone involved in artificial life, evolutionary robotics, open-ended evolution, evolutionary dynamics should be interested in. You know, there's a whole whole array of work on evolutionary robotics, especially about trying to get adaptability out. You know, about getting our agents to be able to deal with the noise in the real world. Well, this is noisy but it's not so noisy that evolution can't grip into it and, and follow. And there's an interesting effect I don't fully understand that if you look at population dynamics data, so 
extinctions or population increases and decreases. This is work of Halley and some of his colleagues. The, if you take the, the population sizes of populations over time, um, for many animal populations, it's pinker than the external environments they're evolving in. Not 100% sure what that means, but it sounds very interesting. Um, I'll have to go back and read the papers again. So pink noise seems really, really important, and I am fascinated by it. So because we won best paper, which was a shock, um, such a shock I wasn't even awake, um, we were invited to, to extend this work for the Artificial Life Journal. Hopefully the reviewers like it and don't get too upset with the errors I found rereading the paper today. So what we decided to do was we decided the one thing that isn't totally clear from this is the effect of reproduction or rate of reproduction. So we were just replacing the worst 50% of the population. But we see in nature, there's a whole bunch of different strategies that emerge. We have um, very short lived species who produce lots and lots and lots of children, um, live for a very short amount of time and very, very little in, in education. You know, the life history is very quick. You know, um, blue bottles and flies, a good example of the kind of animal we're talking about. Um, and you have very slow lived animals, humans being one of the best cases of this, you know, elephants and whales being. Um, you know, also similar examples where we have very few children. Um, we don't come sexually mature for a long time. Um, we require an awful lot of looking after as children. So there's these, these two different strategies that seem to appear. And it would seem that they are two strategies that exist to deal with kind of noisy environments. So if you're a very short lived species, the general idea is that while if the, if the environment changes very quickly um, you might do quite badly but some of your children because you've had so many meaning there's been quite a few mutation events even though the mutation rate is relatively low across all species as far as i'm aware please correct me if i'm wrong because you've got so many children you have quite a lot of mutation events happening in per reproduction per recombination event which means that some of those children are going to be robust to the change which means you can kind of try and stay quite specialist um, while reacting to change. Um, you don't have to do too much general purpose learning. You don't have to be very plastic or adaptable because um, evolution to the adaptability, that adaption for you. Whereas, because we reproduce so infrequently um, and we have to exist over quite a significant number of environments, quite a lot of change, potentially anyway, um, humans have to be quite adaptable. So we evolve kind of tolerant mechanisms, tolerance mechanisms like, um, like culture and social learning, um, tool building, um, a wide range of things we can eat, um, cooking helps that kind of thing, of course. Then um, we have large brains in order to be able to do all of these things. So we have different payoffs in order to be able to accommodate for these changes. So we thought, well, how can we sort of replicate this short-lived versus long-lived short life histories versus long or slow life histories um, idea within our model. Now, of course, we haven't done this very well because it's a lot more complicated than one variant, much, much more complicated. But we thought the closest thing in our, in our model would be the, the reproduction rate, if you like, the, the population that we're removing at every given time step. And 50% is sort of arbitrary. Um, so we thought, well, let's test it from very little change from zero percent on no change and obviously didn't work but to 100 percent, we change all of them at every single time step um 100 being very you know short-lived short life histories you know you only exist within a time step to very low uh, population removal which means most individuals in a population are having to deal with quite a number of time steps now of course they can't involve tolerance mechanisms like learning um so instead tolerance mechanisms that we have here are again, your standard deviation of your Gaussian. So we thought we'd investigate this. We learned our lesson with our 65,000 time steps. So here we've done 8,192, again, for signal processing reasons that slightly beyond me, um, but, but Matt understands them and wrote them, wrote them up very well in the paper. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing myself down here. I really just, Matt did it and I was like, okay, I just, I just believe you. I have other things to, uh, I have other things to do like teach some modules. So these are our results. So 
so what we've done here is on our this one on the left here a we have got our noise color um, demonstrated by the exponent here two being red zero being white one being pink um, against the proportion replacement so 100 percent down to zero percent proportion replacement and the color is uh, represented by the standard deviation the tolerance or, or niche breadth that evolves through the changing of that standard deviation of the Gaussian. Remember, a higher standard deviation will give us a, a higher standard deviation will give us more tolerance, a lower standard deviation will give us less tolerance, more specialism, so more fitness for getting it right, but less fitness for getting it wrong. And what we see, um, if we look at this kind of 0.5 line here, that's the results we've had before. We see, again, pink noise seems to be a transition point, mostly all the way across from kind of above 0.5% uh, deviation to below 0.5% deviation. And up in the top left-hand corner, high replacement rate and white noise leads to quite, um, quite a high level of evolved tolerance because the population is turning over really, really quickly. Um, and it's an unpredictable environment. Whereas if you have um, if you have a noise color which is redder, again, redder noise um, does lead to lower levels of tolerance that are required. And that's across all levels of uh, replacement in the population. And if we look at um, this isn't um, the fitness here, this is the kind of the variation within the population. So we looked at the distance. Um, between the 2.5th and the 97.5th percentile. Um, so basically how, how varied the population is in terms of their locus one, in terms of their mean value of their sand, uh, mean value of the Gaussian. So if you've got a very low value here, we, we're looking at a really highly specialized population that are as a population tracking very well. And if this is bigger, it's a population which is hedging its bets essentially. So you everybody's doing something different in the hope that some of you might be right at the next time step. And as you might predict, if you have, um, if you have white noise and you've got high replacement, you've kind of got this fast life history going on. You know, you've got, you know, you've got a population that's very, very different across the entire population in order to accommodate for these rapid changes. Um, but as you lower the proportion, you get um, very little variation. And then that's the same across noise colors as well. So if you've got red noise, you have very little variation across the population. So we looked into this a little bit more. So the first thing that we did, and this was Matt's idea, and I thought it was a really great idea. Um, I'm giving Matt a lot of credit because Matt deserves a lot of credit for this work. Um, so we thought, well, let's, 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 let's train a neural network to, to fit the data. Um, and then let's look at maybe, um, maybe points that we haven't looked at in our experiment so far. Because um, every single time you produce a color noise time series, it's slightly different. Um, so you're testing a slightly different thing every every time in terms of the noise color of the environment. And obviously you can't test them all, but you can test them all, but it would take quite a long time. Though I reckon this lends itself quite nicely to, um, to using GPUs if you wanted to do paralyzing. So you possibly could, but I haven't really thought too much into that. So from this, we've produced this, produced this mesh of noise color, replacement proportion, and niche breadth. Again, that's our tolerance, that's our standard deviation. And we're basically showing what you what, what we saw on the, the flattened version of this, where at pink noise, you kind of get this fold occurring between these two relatively stable states of, of kind of, a, of low tolerance and high tolerance. And you get a slight up curve in need for tolerance as replaced proportion goes up at the whiter levels of noise. But you get the opposite happening at redder noise. So as your replacement portion goes down, your, um, your, your niche breath does edge up a little bit. So it's kind of opposite. So we looked into this a little bit more. We thought this is quite interesting and unexpected. Though in hindsight, actually, I'm not sure if it is unexpected, um, but it does require a bit of thinking about. So we produce these graphs, which are again showing the same thing again, just in a slightly different way. So, so our A graph here, we're, we're looking at the niche breadth here, the standard deviation of our Gaussians, um, our noise color. And colored here um, is our, um, 
Oh, what's this showing here? Yeah, the color scales representing the reproductive rate. So I totally forgot for a minute. So we have a, a line essentially for each of the reproductive rates um, going from blue up to, I think that's red. So, and we see what we saw on, on the mesh, we see a flip happen. So what we have is a, a, a whiter noise. We require, um, we know we require more tolerance, a higher niche breadth, but what we get is an increase in your niche breadth as you, um, as the reproduction rate goes up, but you get the opposite at red noise. As the reproduction rate goes up, the niche breadth goes down. So that is interesting. And it's also interesting, again, that this, this, this transition occurs sort of in the pink noise range. So it's not happening directly at one now. It's happening at about 0.7, I think. Um, I'd have, have to put out the exact number. But at 0.7, this transition occurs in the pink range. So at the pink range, this, this, these opposite needs converge and actually you get relatively high amounts of consistency of the required tolerance, regardless of reproduction rate. Which in itself is quite interesting and something we don't we don't really understand yet. So this graph here on the right is simply showing that if we take uh, what we did in our 2020 paper, the conference paper, um, as a baseline, um, this dotted line here, the 50% reproduction rate as a baseline, um, and look at the difference between we see this flip again. You know, the difference between what's required at 50% and what's required at um, uh, 100% flips, and the same with what's required at 0% replacement flips if you go from white to red noise. Now, we think this is really important for one very simple reason, and I'll get onto that in a minute. But the basic conclusions here are that redder environments you generally evolve more specialism because the environment is easier to track because of the high levels of water correlation. Um, at whiter environments, you need to be more generalized because you can't make predictions about the environmental state from time step to time step because it's, it's, it's pretty much uncorrelated. You get this complex interaction between noise, color, and reproductive rate. Um, so whiter environments have a rule that greater environmental tolerance under higher reproductive rates, while our redder environments have lower environmental tolerance under high reproductive rates. And pink noise provides this pivot point for the transition from specialist to generalist and relatively consistently um, across reproductive rates as well. So this is important because our conclusions are suggesting at least that employing white noise, conclusions that you would draw from simulations employing white noise would be the opposite of the conclusions drawn from simulations using red noise if you are simulating this kind of dependency on reproductive rate. But generally, in terms of evolution of tolerance, you would get kind of opposite effects. Now, this is important because no one, no one tests across the colored noise range. You know, you do white noise, you do red noise, or you do something else. You know, you just have a sine wave, which I've had in the past dictating environmental change. Or you have some sort of step function where, you know, at a certain point you transition to a different environmental state and then you transition back and you might vary the frequency in which that step occurs. It's very rare for people to test across all of those things. Um, and what we're finding is that um, it produces kind of opposite contradictory results. So you might draw a conclusion that you might propose as relatively general, that actually isn't. The effect of reproductive rate on population diversity is also heavily dependent on color of the environmental noise, barring at pink noise, where you get relative levels of consistency. And finally, I think I am in agreement with, with Halley that pink noise is a good null model for environmental variation. If you're going to produce an environmental time series um, in the way that we have, you know, if you're going to time step by time step, there's some environment that you've got to try and optimize for, or some or some, some external influence which is affecting the world you're in that can be broken down into just, you know, to, to simple values. Why not try a pink noise time series? It contains many features that are 
that are useful in, produce, in producing this balance between specialism and generalism. It backed up through a whole bunch of environmental and ecological time series. Um, and it's quite been able to have quite a lot of robustness to, to variables such as reproductive rate. And we also extend from that probably also mutation rate too. Um, we haven't tested that, but our guess is that mutation is going to have a very similar set of results to reproductive rate. But we're not too committed to that. We do need to, we do need to look into that. And that's one of the possible bits of future work. Um, also, in terms of future work, actually unpicking what's important within these colored noise time series. Um, what is it about pink noise? Is it the fact that you're, you know, the mean of the of the time series moves over time, so it's non-stationary? Is it the nature of the time to time set jumps? Um, you know, the the mean average rate of change is that the important thing, or is it the, the color itself which is important? Um, and unpicking that is something that we we we, we want to try and do next. Um, and hopefully we will get to do at some point soon. So I think I finished with enough time. Um, so I'm happy to have questions. Also, thanks to my collaborators on this. So, so Matt is, um, I'd say more than a primary collaborator, Matt's the primary driving force on this work. Um, as I said, he's a, an evolutionary anthropologist, um, also quite a good modeler. So he actually did most of the coding for this, which felt very uncomfortable for me as a computer scientist, but I had to, uh, I did, I did accept that actually he was producing some pretty, pretty nice models. And it was nice not to have to do the coding. Um, so Matt's done the vast majority of the work on this. Um, I'm just in the background doing some thinking. Um, also thanks to, to, to Ben. Um, Ben's a recently graduated PhD student from Keele, um, excellent PhD student. If anyone wants to give him a postdoc, you know, there's his email address. Um, and Ben helped us a lot out with, the, uh, with some data analysis. Um, He's also helped us out with some extensions we're hoping to do to this project in unpicking the, um, the important aspects of these time series. Um, Lucy um, helped us out a lot with the most recent paper. Lucy is Matt's PhD student. Um, so another evolutionary anthropologist who's interested in modeling, which I think is a very good thing. And of course, the ever wonderful Fiona, who you definitely can't have back. Um, Fiona will underplay her involvement in all of this. Um, but Fiona's primary involvement was in the, the conference paper. We got had one rejected actually um, uh, the year before because we hadn't quite got the model results how yet and we tried to rush a paper out. But much of the writing from that paper moved into the paper that became best paper. And much of that writing happened by Fiona and I sharing an overview document. I wrote and there was just this cursor rewriting behind me it was like someone with a mop following me around as i spilled food everywhere um so fiona basically took my um my thoughts and made them coherent um and asked difficult questions um and made the papers much 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 better as a result um, though she will downplay all of that and she will uh, i doubt she'll uh, agree to the importance of her involvement even after this glowing endorsement by me Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to um, try and get you all back up so I can see you again. Thank you very much for that, uh, James. That was uh, fascinating. And I'm so glad to see that the um, extended paper has now also uh, got even more exciting results. So I'm going to switch the recording off if I can stop recording. Do you want to stop? Yes.